Friends, I'm going to invite uh, you to join with me in the, prepare, in the prayer for illumination as we get ready to receive God's Word. O oh, fire divine, go through my heart. O oh, light eternal, illuminate my soul. May we discover you in our loving through the Spirit of Christ who abides in us. Amen. Scripture passage today is from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, starts in chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. When Jesus had finished saying this to all the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There was a centurion servant whom his master valued highly, who was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some of his elders, of, some elders of the Jews to ask him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves you to, to, to have you do this, because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and I tell that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And in turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house, and they found the servant well. This is the word of the Lord. So we continue with our series uh, where we look at Christ's everyday life and how he interacts with people and how he works with people. Um, and we're going to talk a bit about risk today. But I'll begin by saying this. Um, there was quite a big transition many years ago, in fact, just after World War II, where fighter pilots had to change from a plane with a propeller to a plane with a jet engine. Now, obviously, a plane with a jet engine goes a lot faster than a plane with a propeller. Everybody was excited because you want your fighter to fly faster. But there was an unintended consequence to the new design of the plane being powered by a jet engine. When it came to an emergency and the pilot had to eject from their seat, what they would do in the propeller planes is they'd hit a button, and as the seat ejected out of the, the cockpit, the pilot would just lean forward and fall out of the seat, and their parachute would be able to open. Because obviously as they sit, their parachute is behind them, and the seat behind that. What they found, though, was when they switched to jet engine airplanes, pilots were very hesitant to, to roll out of their seat because the plane was going a lot faster. So what happened is they'd eject, and then they'd grip onto the seat. Well, that doesn't help if you've got a parachute between you and the back of the seat. They had to lean forward and lean out so that they could, in fact, deploy their parachute. But for some reason, they didn't want to take that risk. Now, I know that sounds a little strange. How would a World War II fighter pilot not be able to risk themselves by leaning forward into that seat because that plane was going faster. So what the military had to do was they had to redesign the seat so that in fact what it did was it gave, in essence, gave the pilots a push out of the seat so that they'd fall forward and they could deploy their parachute. They had to get that gentle nudge, that push, because they were afraid to risk. Today's sermon is about risking and about our fears that we sometimes have in risking. Now, I'm not talking risking here in the sense of whether or not you're going to decide to go and buy a lottery ticket after, or lottery ticket after the service. That's not the kind of risk we're talking about. I'm talking about spiritual risks. I'm talking about taking risks in your own faith. And how we're going to do this is we're going to look at Jesus, 
and we're going to look at the Roman officer, the two main people in the story. And we're going to look at the servant, servant who seems to take a back seat, but who really the healing's all about. And I would hope that as we look at these people involved in the story, that it would teach us something about taking a risk. So we need to frame this a little in understanding who this Roman centurion was in that society. So the Romans occupied Israel. It was a, an, a, some kind of an agreeable occupation. I think that's the, the best way I could probably put it. But overall, it wasn't received very well. Who likes their country to be occupied by a foreign military force? So even though some of the day-to-day stuff was okay, there was this overall dissatisfaction with Rome occupying Israel, the land of the Jews. And it went further than that because this Roman would have been a Gentile. He was a non-Jew. And the Jews had very specific rules about how you interacted with non-Jews. There's an interesting piece in the story or verse in the story where he says to Jesus, I know I'm not worthy that you would come and visit with me. Well, where does that come from? If we go back to the book of Acts chapter 10 at 28, he says, he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit with a Gentile. So the Jewish law said that this Roman centurion couldn't have Jesus come into his house. So yes, there was a sense of friendliness here, but there was also a sense in which this Roman centurion was risking himself in approaching Jesus, a Jewish leader, for healing for his servant. Now, obviously in this local area, this Roman centurion is well or held in good esteem. We're told in verse 2 that um, the, sorry, in verse 5, that he had built a synagogue. Now, it wasn't him on his own that decided to do that. Uh, History tells us that the Emperor Augustus encouraged the Roman uh, soldiers to, to build synagogues because it kind of built some diplomacy, built a bridge between Jewish land and the Roman occupation. So in this area, it's It's well-received, and it makes this guy look good. We're also told he's a good man because he cares for the servant, the servant of his. Reminder that in Jesus' days, servants were no different than the wheel on an ox cart. They were a piece of property. The only difference between them and the wheel and the ox cart was they could speak. But really, in terms of Roman law, the, the servant was just that. He's a property that they own. But somehow this guy cares for this servant of his, which the people respect. And they see him as good. He's a good man, so he deserves it, they tell Jesus. And the servant is also very, very sick. Luke says he's about to die. Matthew kind of expands on his sickness a bit in saying that this man is paralyzed and he's suffering. So this Roman centurion cares for the servant, obviously as a human being, not just as a piece of property. So in local eyes, he's held in high esteem. But this Roman centurion may know what his own community thinks of him, but he doesn't know what Jesus thinks. He's obviously heard of Jesus' healing. He's obviously heard of who Jesus is, but he doesn't know what Jesus' opinion is on Roman officials. So it's a risk for him to go and ask for help from Jesus. How's he going to respond to me as a Gentile? Because I'm not even welcome, I'm not allowed to welcome him into my own home. So here's this Roman centurion who has a well-established relationship with his community, who's a person in authority, as well as being well-regarded by his community, approaching a Jesus who he's heard something about, but he doesn't fully know what Jesus' reaction is going to be to him. So let's think about that for a moment and the risk that he takes in going to ask Jesus for help. He admits to Jesus that I'm a, he says, I'm a person in high authority, but I also recognize authority when it's, when it's over me. But nonetheless, even though I'm a person with a lot of authority, I come to you, Jesus, humbly asking you 
to heal my servant. I think that's a great lesson for us in a very individualistic society that we lived in. We're encouraged to build our own lives, make our own lives, make something of ourselves. Some of us have done very well in that, in the point that we're incredibly independent kind of people. But it's very hard when you are a well-established, very independent kind of person, maybe leaning towards a person who likes to be in control. It's very hard to then submit to Jesus. And that's what's amazing to Jesus about this man. This well-established, independent individual comes to Jesus for help. He submits to Christ. How do you find that in your own lives? Do you find submitting to Jesus easy? Or do you find your desire to be in control gets in the way of that openness with Christ? Because it can. Our stubbornness and our pride can play into that too, in that it makes it a lot more difficult to humble ourselves before Christ, which is what this Roman centurion did. He essentially had the faith of the child where he humbled himself before Jesus' authority and recognized that Jesus' authority was even greater than his own. Another, bless you, great question. Do I recognize that Jesus' authority is greater than my own opinions, than my own self-established life, than my own opinion, especially of my own self? Because sometimes it is very hard when we get right before Christ and right in front of Christ to let go our lives fully. I don't know about you, but there's some parts of my life where I find very easy to surrender, and there are other parts of my life that I find incredibly difficult to surrender. For whatever reason, I want to hold on to them. Perhaps in the ignorance of thinking that I know better. But to fully submit to Jesus is a difficult thing for us to do, and it it means that we've got to take a risk. We've got to take a risk and submit ourselves fully to Christ. That Christ would determine and shape my life. That Christ would determine and shape my opinions. Are we willing to go to that place and risk like this this centurion did? Are we willing to submit to Jesus' authority? Because that's what it will take. Full submission. Jesus asks no less. Because how else is he going to work with the difficult parts of our lives if we don't surrender them to him? How else does Jesus work in our lives if we selfishly or, 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 or somewhat ignorantly hold on to the, own thi- the things that we think are of value to us, but we won't let Jesus address us, we won't let him challenge us? The risk of submitting something that grows our faith and strengthens our faith. So the officer risks in his position, he risks in helping Christ, in asking Christ for help. That's his risk that he takes. Now Jesus risks in response. You say, Jesus, Jesus, Son of God, how's he risking in this situation? Well, remember, Jesus is fully human. So in this situation, the fact that he's helping an enemy officer is a risk. Now, we know, we know that that local community held him in high regard. In fact, somehow the Bible often paints Roman centurions in a very positive light. It was the Roman centurion who was at the foot of the cross who recognized that Jesus was Messiah. It was a Roman centurion who became the first Gentile member of the Christian church. So the Bible often portrays Roman centurions in a very positive light, but the bigger picture wasn't always that. There were lots of people who loved to criticize Jesus. There were all kinds of people who crawled out the woodwork and said, Jesus, let me tell you how you can do a better job of being the Messiah. The fact that he would reach out and help an occupying enemy was a huge risk. Because all of a sudden, he'd have all these experts crawling out about what the Messiah should and shouldn't do. He risked being judged by the the Jewish leaders of that time, by the individuals. But Jesus risks. He reaches out, as he so often does throughout his life. He reaches out to those who the crowd somehow don't think 
qualify quite for Jesus to reach out to them. He reaches out to those who often people would say, oh, no, no, you just should. Jesus, the Messiah, wouldn't be hanging out with those kinds of people. But Jesus risks. He doesn't worry about what society thinks. He doesn't worry about how people classify each other. But he still has to take the risk in reaching out to the centurion. So that's Jesus' first risk that he makes. And he risks because he risks based on the person's faith. It's kind of like the doorway that opens Jesus' uh, uh, ministry is that ability to have faith. And Jesus responds to that. Now, what's interesting in the story, let's take a little side note quickly. When I started this sermon series, I wanted to focus in on how our actions, being like Christ's actions, help us to point others to Jesus. But what I've noticed in each of these sermons that I've prepared is that this element of faith keeps on coming up. And here we have another very different kind of element of faith. It's not the slave, it's not the servant who comes to Jesus and says, I need healing. Jesus doesn't respond to his faith, whatever that may be. What Jesus responds to is someone's faith in the situation. In this case, it's the Roman centurion. Jesus responds to that faith. Again, we've said that you know, some people will describe faith, and I've heard churches and I've heard pastors describe it this way, that you know, if you have enough faith, then God will work with you. If you have enough faith, God will heal you. If you have enough faith, God will address your problems. If you hear people say that, please would you point them to the story? Because it's not the servant who comes to Jesus. It's somebody else who goes to Jesus. And Jesus responds, and he risks in responding to this somebody else, to this Gentile. So then let's talk about the second risk, risk that Jesus takes. He, he risks healing a slave, somebody who's seen as a nobody. Why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus go pray for the wheel on an ox wagon? Because it's about the equivalent in their society. Because Jesus cares. Because all of the barriers that we can throw up at Christ are actually no barrier to him at all. All of the things that we put in place, our societal norms, all of our classifications of us and them doesn't work with Jesus. He moves beyond that. He moves beyond this this slave being a nobody and makes them into a somebody. We've seen those time and time again in the story. And again, what Jesus is doing here is risking what society would value or judge him on. That Messiah guy, not only does he heal Gentile people, but he heals slaves. What kind of Messiah is that? He should be better than that. Not for Jesus. But you know, the challenge in this is that Jesus asks us to risk in the same way. That we would reach out and give a voice to those who are voiceless. That we would go beyond society norms and live by Christ's norms. That's the risk that Jesus is asking us to take. So not only a risk in submitting ourselves fully to Christ, but that we would risk ourselves in moving beyond our own place of comfort. And then there's a third risk here. It's the risk of being weak and asking someone else for help. We don't know why that servant couldn't directly communicate and send a message to Jesus. But somebody else does it for him. And you may be at a point in your life where somebody else has got to pray for you. Or where you've got to ask someone to pray for you. That's a risk too. It's a risk to admit my faith is weak. It's a hard thing to say sometimes, especially if you've been in this church for a long time and everybody thinks, oh, you're you're the spiritual person. What do you do when your faith is weak? Are you able to say to someone else, I need you to pray for me? I need you to pray for me spiritually because I'm having a really difficult time with God. 
Maybe that really difficult time is even in believing in God. But it's a risk that we take. The risk in asking for spiritual help. So yes, this is a story that challenges us, that asks us to step out and submit ourselves more than we ever have before to Christ. It's a story that says we need to risk in society and be who Jesus wants us to be rather than who other people want us to be. And it's a story of risk in that sometimes we need to pick up a phone or send a text and say to somebody, I need help. My faith is not good. Please, lift me up. Because when you risk yourself in submission and when you risk to do what God asks you to do rather than what other people expect you to do, and when you risk with your faith, you then begin to point other people towards Jesus Christ. So risk. Risk.